for a call to worship. Praise the Lord, he's here. Suddenly, the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. I get two uh, daily devotions by email every day, and that scripture and what I'm about to read was in one of them on the 24th. This one is uh, Today's Word. Uh, it's written by Joel Osteen. The other one I get all the time is written by... Uh, yeah, that guy. <laughs> I'm starting to get dementia. I can't remember. <laughs> anyway, he did one of our... He did the... Uh, man, that's driving me nuts. Okay. Joe Barnett. In our fellowship. He's older than I am. I heard him when I was in college as a young man. But anyway, about this passage that we just read, on the night Jesus Christ was born, shepherds were out in the field near Bethlehem, when an angel appeared to them and told them the good news about his birth. Then suddenly, a vast host of angels appeared who were praising God. Now, I don't know if you've ever stopped to think about it, that there was one angel showed up and then all of a sudden he had this backup chorus. You know, and it's just this amazing thing in the heavens. The scripture tells us that there are angels in heaven singing God's praises day and night. Think about this. When we praise God, we are joining with the angels in heaven. What an awesome thought that we can be one with the heavenly hosts when we worship. And so as we come to worship this morning, and especially in our song service, since we all participate, we can be one with that heavenly host. We are all praising God together. And our first song this morning follows right out of the scripture, Joy to the World. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare Him room. And let the nature sing. And let the nature sing. And let heaven and earth and nature sing. Joy to the earth, the Savior reigns. Let hills and plains, repeat the sounding joy, repeat the sounding joy, repeat, repeat the sounding joy. No more the sins and sorrows grow, nor thorns in death's a ground. He comes to make his blessings flow. For as the curse is found, for as the curse is found, for as for as the curse is found, he rules the world with truth and grace, and makes the nations prove the glories of his righteousness and wonders of his love and wonders of his love. I chose this not only because of the time of year, but after discussing with Ryan, verse 3 especially, Jesus came to bring priests, priests, peace and order to a chaotic world. No more let sins and sorrows grow. Yes, we have them. I've got one right now. Barbara's not doing well. This stuff, this stuff has finally caught up with her. There were thorns infest the ground. Did you know there were no thorns in the Garden of Eden? That's all part of the curse. That's all part of the fallen world. He comes to make his blessings flow far as that curse is found. And so that's why Jesus came. That's one of many reasons Jesus came. But he came to bring us the peace that I started with. All right, continuing in that theme, before Jerry leads us in prayer, let's sing, Savior, grant me rest in peace. Oh, and by the way, Mark, thank you. Uh, Gary and Barbara and Eagle Wonder here. The song leader does have to swallow occasionally. <laughs> so if I cut out for a note or two, you all just keep singing. Right. I will be back. Right. 
Savior, grant me rest and peace. Let my troubled dreaming cease. With the chiming midnight bell, teach my heart that all is well. I would trust my all with thee. All my cares and sorrows flee. There comes to my heart one sweet strain, a glad and a joyous refrain. I sing it again and again, sweet peace, the gift of God's love. Peace, peace, sweet peace, wonderful peace from
piece that passes under state of the heart. about the Lord's Supper. And then there's a part about proclaiming here about the Lord's death. So I'm going to read 23 through 29. He says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he gave thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup also after the supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks and eats and drinks judgment to himself, if he does not judge the body rightly. So, in the middle of this, it talks about when we eat the bread and we drink the cup, we proclaim the Lord's death. We proclaim to the world that we believe that Jesus is the Messiah, that He came to earth, and he died for our sins. And he rose again. We're proclaiming it to the world. Every time we partake of the Lord's Supper. Just like that proclamation that the angels did. And in, uh, in Acts 17, it talks about a little bit more. Paul does this again. In Acts 17, Paul goes to Thessalonica. And it says in 17, 1 through 3, it says, Now when you have... He had traveled to Amphipolis and that Apollonia, no, I'm missing these up. They came to Thessalonica, where they were a synagogue of the Jews. And according to Paul's custom, he went to them for three Sabbaths, reasoned with them about the scriptures, explaining and giving evidence that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, saying, This Jesus whom I am proclaiming to you is the Christ. Paul is out there when he's teaching. He's also proclaiming to the Jews and to others, the Gentiles, that this Jesus who was crucified and is resurrected is that Christ that everybody was looking for. He's proclaiming it to the world. And that's what I wanted to say here. When we, we declare it, we are saying it, to the world. We're proclaiming to the world. And we're also, when you think about it, it builds our strength up because we're making sure that we're proclaiming it to ourselves, that we've got to be strong. That when somebody asks us, why are you a Christian? We can proclaim to them. We can teach them, just like Paul did in Thessalonica, that this is the Christ. This is why He came. He died for our sins. He died for everyone in the world. We want everybody to hear that proclamation, that knowing that why Jesus died. And when we partake of the Lord's Supper, we do that not only in our group here as a family, we proclaim it to each other, but we're also proclaiming to the world that Christ 
is that Messiah mm -hmm. that He came for all of us. And we'll we'll pass out the bread and we'll proclaim it together. Father, we love you and praise your name. And as we proclaim this great thing that Jesus did for us, coming to earth, become a human being, to suffer and die on the cross for us, that great sacrifice that was given, we thank you so much for sending him and giving us that great sacrifice. Now, as we partake of this Lord, this bread that represents that body that was hung on the cross, Let's proclaim it and think about that thing into our own hearts and proclaim to others around us what we believe. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, as we continue our prayer about this Lord's Supper, thinking about that blood that was shed on the cross, and if we partake of this fruit of the vine that represents that, we thank you so much for that blood that courses through our veins now. As he's adopted, we're your adopted sons and daughters. We're part of the family now. And as we proclaim that to the world and also to ourselves, and we are so looking forward for you to come and take us to you. We do this remembering all the things that you've done for us. We thank you for Jesus, especially at this time. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. about all the many blessings that we've been given this year's about done and this has been a pretty tough year when you think about it um, especially to this world and the people around us we've lost people we've, we've known for a long time and the, well, the people that we've lost recently are with Christ they're the things you know when we talk about things about losing Clarice and we think about all those things but the blessing is that we know we have that great hope that we have in our hearts that we're going to see all these people again. And so all those blessings that we take for granted in the world around us sometimes, we forget about where they all come from. They come from God. Every bit of them. And the greatest blessing of all was sending His Son for us. And so when we give back it's not just the monies that we give back, but we also need to remember to give back everything that we are back to Him. Because He gave it. He gave it to us in the beginning. He let us have all the things that we have. And really, when we go, guess what? It stays with someone else or stays here. It sure doesn't. We sure ain't taking it with us. The greatest blessing, though, is we get to go and be with Him. We pray with Him. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the many things you've given us and blessing us with in this world. And we're so looking forward to being with you, the greatest blessing of all, being with you in heaven. As we give back just a little bit, a portion, let's use it as good stewards to further your kingdom here on earth. In Jesus' name.
Before we hear from Ryan, we're going to sing Master of the Tempest is Raging. After this lesson, uh, I'll go ahead and tell you now, I should have put the slide here instead of where I put it. Uh, we're going to sing Peace, Perfect Peace, which doesn't sound like much of a challenging song, but I think after you hear what Ryan has to say, we'll see how it fits. How many of you like this song? This is a fun song to sing. Yeah, my song is most of my life, but it, it really has a cool message. And I really like the way the, the writer of the song starts off talking about that event when Jesus and his apostles were on the sea. And the second verse is really talking about us and our lives today. And then the third verse kind of ties both of those thoughts together at the very end. So, so watch for that as we sing this. Master, the tempest is raging, the bills are tossing high. The sky is overshadowed with blackness, no shelter or help is nigh. Care is the lot that we perish, how can the lie asleep? When each moment so many is threatening, I pray in the angry deep. The winds and the waves shall obey thy will. Storm tossed sea, or beans, or men, or whatever it be. No water can swallow the ship when life is a master of ocean and earth and skies. They all shall sweetly obey my will. Peace be still, peace be still. They all shall sweetly obey thy will. Master, with anguish of spirit, I bow in my grief today. The depths of my sad heart are troubled. Awaken and save, I pray. Towards the sin and the vanquish, sweep on my sinking soul. And I perish, I perish, dear Master. Oh, hasten and take control. The winds and the waves shall obey my will. Storm tossed sea, or demons, or men, or whatever it be. No water can swallow the ship where lies the master of ocean and earth and skies. They all shall sweetly obey thy will. Peace be still, peace be still. They all shall sweetly obey thy will. Master, the terror is over, the elements sweetly rest. The sun in the calm lake is mirrored, and heaven's within my breast. Linger, O oh blessed Redeemer, leave me alone no more. And with joy I shall make the blessed harbor, and rest on the blissful shore. The winds and the waves shall obey thy will. Whether the wrath of the storm toss sea, or demons or men, or whatever it be, no water can swallow the ship where lies the master of ocean and earth and sky. They all shall sweetly obey thy will. Peace be still, peace be still. They all shall sweetly obey thy will. Mark and Jerry for uh, the songs and the words uh, and, and the thoughts that you shared with us. Mark, you uh, you managed to preach my sermon for me in your contribution. Uh, usually at the Lord's Supper when I get when I get foiled, but this time it was the the contribution where you kind of hit right on what we're going to talk about today. Uh, Ken came to your Ken and I got together for lunch earlier in the week uh, after Clarice's funeral. In fact, uh, this past week. And, um, and and Ken wanted to kind of talk about what you know was planning the song service out what I was going to talk about and he, he started by saying you know what are we what are we looking at with baptism you know and I said well I think 
given the year we've had, that I don't want to do baptism this week. I want to talk about the year we've had because I think sometimes when you have years that are good, you want to talk about them because they're good. And sometimes when you have years that aren't so good, you want to sort of commemorate them. And I thought it would be kind of uh, a good thing for us, maybe not an easy thing, but a good thing for us to talk about it and also um, sort of give honor to some of the things that we've lost and some of the things that have happened this past year. So this sermon is entitled 2021 Year in Review. Um, it's a very dry sounding title. It gets better, I promise. Um, but as we talk about this past year, we look at the year in review, the dominant the dominant theme this past year has been COVID-19 again. Uh, it was that way in 2020. It's this way again in 2021. Back in 2020, roughly one and a half million deaths throughout the world were attributed to COVID-19. And the idea was that with the coming of the vaccines and with the uh, the, the way that the improvements in, in how we, uh, we know how to treat COVID and some of those things that 2020 would be better, but 2021 rather, has uh, almost uh, three or over 3.8 million deaths. More than twice as many people died this year from COVID-19 than died last year. And, and not only that, but it keeps mutating. And so this past year, we've had to deal with the Delta variant. We've had to deal with the Omicron variant. And by the way, if you know Greek lettering, you know there's about six or seven letters between oh. Delta and Omicron. And that's because all the different mutations that they've encountered of this virus, it's just that every once in a while, a mutation comes along that's really nasty. And those are the ones that cause us all the problems. <coughs> no reason to think we are going to see more of those things as well. So COVID has been the dominant story and has impacted our lives in, in a lot of different ways and has caused a lot of different problems. But one of the, the areas where it certainly initially, at least in 2020, kind of seemed like one of the, the good things about, if you can say that, about COVID and about the changes it was causing in people's behavior is that it was reducing some of the violence that we were seeing in our society. We weren't seeing the same kind of um, of, of mass shootings and some of those kinds of things. But the interesting thing is when they finished doing the statistics for 2020 and mid-2021, what they discovered was that actually violent crime had increased 30% over 2019. One of the largest increases in violent crime, and particularly in murder, actually, I should say, that the homicide rate, 30% increase over the year before. That was 2020. The scary thing is that we're a long way from knowing what the actual final homicide statistics are for 2021, but in 2021, 12 major cities throughout the country have already hit all-time highs for murders in 2021, and this was a month ago. So it's certain that all of them are going to be well over their, their numbers, and there's a number of other cities that might hit that as well. So what's, what's troubling is that, in fact, what we're seeing is that violent crime has not gone down, um, that, that the fact that people are... are congregating less and doing things less doesn't seem to be having any positive effect on the way that we're treating each other. And you think, well, maybe at least it will cut down on the property crime, on the things that we do, uh, the, the thefts and things like that that happen. And of course, what we've seen this year is this rise of what they call flash mob robberies, where you'll have you know a dozen or more people that'll go into a high-end store and just clear the store out of, of possessions or out of, out of goods over the, the course of a few minutes before the police can respond, knowing that there's little, if any, uh, accountability that might go along with that. And so, and this is kind of a new thing, at least in this country, to see this kind of thing happening in an organized fashion. Um, and so what that speaks to is not just the notion that people are being more, uh, doing more thefts, but also that there's beginning to be a breakdown in the way that we think about law and order in this society. And, and not only that, Kim pointed this out to me, that there's another thing that's been growing, another, another trend that's been growing, especially on the East Coast, is they're having these anti-vaccination sit-ins where people who are against vaccination mandates will go into not the government halls that created them, but they'll go into restaurants and other places, uh, businesses, and they'll do sit-ins to protest the vaccinations. Now, in the civil rights movement, there were times where the, where the civil rights activists would go in and do sit-ins in restaurants and in businesses that were, uh, that were segregating or refusing to serve blacks or whatever, but that was targeted at the businesses that actually have those policies. This it's crazy because this is targeting businesses that have no ability to say yes or no to these mandates that the government is creating, and yet people are just going in and doing this and creating all sorts of chaos and havoc. And what we're seeing is an increasing amount of, of discord and disunity among our people, and then part of it is, is endemic, and part of it is kind of coming out of the COVID situation. And we also see that the quality of life 
You know, we, we, think, we want to think of America as being the, the greatest nation in the world where people have the best standard of living. And, and it, in some ways, we're, we're among the best nations. But when you look at what's going on, out of a nation of about 340 million people or something like that, 40 million of us are living in poverty. That means that they're living below the limit of what the government considers to be a, a, a reasonable, functional standard of living. There are 38 million people that are living with hunger. 12 million of those are children that are living with that kind of thing that are daily not sure if they're going to get enough to eat to be able to be satisfied. And there are about 500,000, half a million people that are living on the streets at any given time. And of course, in the summers down in the valley and in the winters up here, that's a particularly miserable place to be, but that's, that's the reality. Here again, a significant portion of those are children as well. And also a number of them, a lot of them are mentally, uh, they have, have got a, a variety of mental health issues that are, that are driving a lot of this stuff. And so we see that in spite of the, 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 the wealth that we have in this country, a lot of our population is not sharing and they're not enjoying the benefits of that. And you think, well, we've got all these bad things going on, but at least we have our churches, at least we have the, the sort of the, the bastion of, of godliness and of, of goodwill towards men, so to speak, that we've got going on. And the problem, of course, is that COVID has impacted that too. And it's not like it's a new thing. There's been a downward trend in attendance in churches over the course of the last several decades. But right now, the numbers say that the attendance of ch churches right now is only 36% of what it was prior to COVID. And a lot of the people that are being surveyed are saying, we're not interested in going back physically to church. Now, we might still Zoom or, or virtually uh, be part of it. We're not interested in being physically present at church. And one of the problems that we find out of that is that a lot of what church does, a lot of how church impacts our lives, is number one, by interacting with other people, but also by what we do together, by going out and doing things, by, by being participative. And if it's all going to be a virtual experience, a lot of that stuff just goes away. And that's the reality we're looking at right now. We also see that, that actually right now, uh, the statistics say that one in five churches faces closure within the next 18 months through a combination of the overall decline in attendance and also of the, particularly of the COVID-driven issues along with that. And then within our churches, there are all kinds of divisions, but COVID has created a new set of them. And so you have you know, memberships that are at odds over. There's, there's a general agreement that the leadership of churches should come up with a way to deal with COVID. And that's the end of the agreement points. Everything else is, this is what they should do, this is what they should do. And so if, you are, if you're a church that says we've got to have masks so people need to be vaccinated, a bunch of people are upset about that. If you say we're not going to have masks or we're not going to require vaccination, a bunch of people are upset about that. Nobody's happy about anything. And you've got ministers preaching from the, the pulpit that are attacking either other ministers or that are attacking the government for instituting method, uh, um, um, uh, mandates and things like that. But there's all kinds of division within the churches, and churches are preaching, actively preaching division over these issues, which, quite frankly, is something that is historically almost unknown. Now, there were times when we were considering as nations entering into wars that from the pulpits, preachers were preaching, let's not do that, and they were preaching contrary to what the government wanted to do. But that's a pretty clear argument. You know, the notion of, of that, that we shouldn't engage in war. There's, there's a lot of support for that idea. But we're talking about how we deal with a disease. And nobody in history, in history of the churches of America, you've really never seen major groups of churches saying, we're going to preach against what the government is trying to do to, to, to regulate and, and, and make things safer. And my point is not to argue who's right and who's wrong. My point is that what we're seeing is this unprecedented amount of division and chaos. And, and when you just look at our society and our... And our year in general, that's the kind of year it's been. And Ken said, I really hope you have something hopeful to say. <laughs> well, let me first start by explaining where this is coming from. Because it's not, if we, if we, want, to, if we want to just say, okay, well, it's just the people are mean and that there's COVID and, and we, we look at it and we try to, try to give an explanation for it that's just a series of random factors. That's not really understanding the issue because the issue is driven by a singular concept in human existence. And James explains it this way. He says, what is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is not the source of your pleasures that wage war in your members? You lust and you do not have, so you commit murder. You are envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask, and you ask and do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives, so that you may spend it on your pleasures. 
You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility towards God? Now he's talking specifically to Christians and why Christians are dysfunctional and their relations are dysfunctional. But the broader point that's there is that the reason that we have all these things in the world is because of sin. A lot of it goes back to Adam. And Adam's sin, uh, I forget who mentioned the, the thorns, uh, Ken, I think, the, the thorns um, in the garden. There were no thorns in the garden. The thorns came because of the sin, because of being kicked out of the garden, because of the penalty. And more broadly, the world was broken when that happened. And so things like earthquakes and tidal waves and tsunamis and, and hurricanes and, and diseases that had never existed before became a possibility, a reality in that broken world. And so ultimately sin drives both the physical dysfunction of this world and more even explicitly the spiritual dysfunction of this world, the discord and jealousy and murder and all this sort of chaos that we're seeing that's driven by sin. And the thing is that, that, that sin has an even deeper and, and more fundamental effect, and that is that it causes death. And for us here in the church this year, we've experienced this. I can, can uh, and I talked after, my, during my second year here, that for the first two years that I was here, nobody went in the hospital even. Well, one exception, or, uh, Ari, Ari went into the hospital for a period of, a little period of time there, but for the most part, even though this is kind of an aging congregation, nobody went to the hospital, nobody got seriously sick, certainly nobody passed away for two years. And then we got to my third year and it wasn't so good. So we had Ron Clark, or sorry, Ralph Clark pass away earlier in the year and shortly after him, Don Booth, who although he wasn't a member here, somebody that all of you know, and then, of course, Clarice passed away just a week and a half or so ago. And another man I know, not one that you know, but Ross Holman, who's a member, had been a member down at Desert Sands, passed away from COVID um, around the same time. And, and, and those are just a few of the deaths that I think people, that we, I, I imagine all of you know people who passed away in the past year, either from old age or from difficulty. Jerry has lost uh, family members. Um, we've, we've, we've lost people. Um, either from COVID or from other things, but, but that death in this year, it just seems like there's been a lot of losses like that. Um, a lot of people that we know and knew who have passed away. And the thing about that is that sin is still the driving factor there. Not, not the individual person's sin, but the consequences of the first sin. Over in Genesis chapter 2, it says, The Lord God commanded the man, that's Adam saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat from it you will surely die. And over in Romans, Paul explains the consequences this way, through one man sin entered into the world, death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. The reality is that even people who are good people, even people who are sanctified by Christ's blood, they still die because we all die. Because that is a consequence of sin being in the world, and that is the reality that we live in. And, and it's made for a pretty bad year in a lot of ways. And there's been good things that have happened this year, and there's been positive things, but, but I think if we looked at it on the whole, we would just as soon not have another year like this anytime soon. You know? What's interesting, though, is when you think about this, we think this has been a bad year, and there's no question that it has. But if you go through history, you can find some worse years. And one of those is 1914. 1914 was a really bad year, because in 1914, uh, there, were, there were a lot of things going on in Europe, a lot of countries that weren't getting along very well, and ultimately, three of those countries, Germany, Austria, Hungary, and the Ottoman Empire, banded together and formed what they called the Central Powers, and decided that they would basically wage war on the rest of Europe. Uh, and so, on, in, in the, the very end of July of 1914, those three countries together basically invaded outward all directions to the to the east they, they or sorry to the east they invaded Russia to the west they invaded France and, and Belgium and some other places into the south they invaded down towards the Middle East and they they began a war that ultimately was opposed by a group of allied powers the British the French the Russians the Italians and Serbia which was a much more powerful nation at the time than it has become today and initially, at least, as, as happened also in a later war, those, those nations had a lot of success in pushing outward into France and into uh, the, the, the Middle East and into Russia. And the other nations stiffened their resolve and, and formed their, their lines of battle and, and, and stopped their advances. 
And what happened was that what was expected to be a relatively short war, of course the invading countries thought, we can get this done in a matter of months, we'll win and it'll be great. The other, other part, uh, side thought, once we stop the advance, we'll be able to repulse them and this will be happening in a fairly short period of time and we'll be over with. And the reason they thought that is because they were operating under a different expectation of what war looked like than it turned out that they were. This would ultimately, what, what we're talking about here would ultimately become what's known as World War I or the Great War. A war in which nine million combatants died and another five million civilians died. It was the worst war until, you know, the next one, World War II. But, but World War I, well, they expected it to be quick. They expected it to be simple because they were still by and large operating or thinking that things were going to operate under a system of warfare that had gone on for quite a long time that was seen in America, the American Civil War, for example, which was the notion of what's called line and volley. And the idea in the Civil War is that you'd be, everybody was armed with these fairly primitive muskets. And muskets can only shoot once before you had to reload them, which took 30 seconds to a minute, depending on how good you were at it. And so the way that they actually made war was you would have large armies and they would form battle lines of two or three or four soldiers deep. And those soldiers would line up and there would be the other side and you would shoot at them and everybody on the front line would shoot all their rifles at the same time and then they'd run around to the back and the next group would shoot all their rifles. And, and so what was really the, the core of winning a battle like this was being able to maneuver into a position where all of your rifles could shoot and a lot less of theirs could or where your men had, you had more men in the right place than they did in the right place. And so it was this notion of line and volley, and volley was the shooting of the guns. But maneuver was one of the main central ideas of this. And maneuver was a central idea. Now, they, in, in the period of time after the American Civil War, which was in the 1860s, some of the developments in rifle technology had meant that more and more there was going to be the ability to, to shoot faster. And so the notions of warfare had changed some, but not that much. This was still kind of more the concept. And so the men in the Civil War were armed with these single shot muskets that took a long time to reload. And the big, the big weapons in the war were these cannons, cannons like this one, cannons that could shoot um, you know, uh, 12 to 24 pound projectile, which is pretty big. Um, they could shoot it a thousand or two thousand yards away. That's a long way. That's half a mile or more. And they could, and then they were explosive, and they were they were dangerous and everything. Um, and the thought was, okay, so so these are the kinds of weapons that the men are armed with, and these are the kinds of cannons that we have on there. And as the weapons became a little bit better, the idea was, okay, maybe we can't just form a bunch of lines and shoot at each other, but we will form groups of infantry, and they will move on the battlefield, and they will maneuver, and there will be there will be these battles, and cavalry, horse-mounted cavalry, will back them up. But some things happened between the American Civil War and World War I that really didn't, uh, didn't come into play very much of the battles and the wars that followed that one, but that came into play in World War, in World War I that were totally different. The first one was that the muskets that they used to shoot that have were replaced by rifles like these. This is the Lee Enfield rifle. It's a bolt action rifle with a 10 round magazine. Now bo bolt action are still a lot slower than the modern day rifles we have today where you can just pull the trigger as fast as you want to. But there's a big difference between having to take 30 seconds to a minute to reload between each shot and just having to do this. That doesn't take any time at all. And when you've got 10 rounds and you can shoot that fast and you're shooting projectiles that are much more accurate, it's a lot more damage that can be done. But that wasn't even the big problem. The big problem was things like this. This is the Maxim machine gun. The machine gun really makes it hard for you to have a bunch of infantry go run it up somewhere or a cavalry charge. That doesn't go well at all. And the thing that got really bad was this. You know those cannons I was showing you a minute ago, 12 to 24 pound projectiles? This is a small, by World War I standard, howitzer. It shoots, uh, let's see, what does it shoot? 200 pound projectiles and it shoots at 10,000 yards. So it's 10 times more powerful and it shoots at 10 times farther. And so artillery became the, the most devastating thing of all in World War I. And what quickly became apparent is you couldn't get a bunch of men together you know, running across a battlefield to take a take an enemy formation, because if you did, you were all going to die. And what ended up happening is the development of something called trench warfare, where both sides dug trenches, and they hid in those trenches and just kind of randomly shot at each other. And sometimes the trenches could be just, you know, 30 or 40 meters apart from each other, but nobody could go from one side to the other, because in the middle of that, uh, well, actually, I shouldn't say, in the middle of that was a no man's land. And initially, the trenches, they, both sides dug the trenches thinking, this will just take a little while. We'll, we'll figure out a way to beat this, but eventually the trenches got more and more elaborate until they became places where people lived for months on end. 
And they would just, you know, they would shoot, you know, to suppress the enemy on the other side, and the enemy would shoot back at them, and it just went on and on. And what was supposed to be a quick war of a few months turned into a war, battles that were lasting months and months and months and, and years and years eventually. And ultimately, like I said, in between those trenches, even when they might not be that far apart, was no man's land, a place of barbed wire to prevent anybody from charging anywhere very fast and, and just just destroyed and desolate land, just a brutal, brutal place to be in. It's a brutal kind of warfare. It's, it's a very inhumane kind of warfare because even as, as awful as things like the Civil War were, where so many people died, you had to be recognizing the reality that you were killing a human being when you shot at them because you weren't that far away. And even the cannons that they were shooting weren't that far away. But when you're killing people from three miles away, you don't have to think about the fact that they're people. And when you're using a machine gun to mow down a squad of people, you don't really see them as people so much as just targets. And so this notion of the inhumanity of World War I was something that was completely foreign to people. And it made for a miserable year. And this went on for months in 1914. And, and something, though, really interesting happened because on one particular day in 1914, both sides, up and down the line, stopped shooting each other. And all the cannons, not all of them, but most of the cannons stopped shooting. And there wasn't everywhere on the line. And these lines, these were miles and miles long lines by, through, the, the, through France. The cannons stopped firing. And men started waving white flags on both sides and climbed out of their trenches and met each other in no man's land and began to talk and, and, and speak to one another because it was Christmas Day of 1914. And Christmas is not the day you're supposed to be fighting. And so something that has never happened before or since in warfare, a truce was called informally by the people that were fighting it because they were tired of being inhumane to each other. And they wanted to act like human beings for one day. And so for one day, the Allied powers and the Central powers got together on the battlefields of France and just hung out and talked to each other and drank together and exchanged souvenirs and in some cases actually started up some impromptu soccer games just because it was Christmas Day. And so you have these amazing photos where I couldn't tell you which is which in some cases, but these minglings of these different allied and, and, um, and central powers, Germans and, and, and British and French mingling together. This one, if you look at it more closely, I mean, you're not going to have time to, these guys are actually making funny faces the way you might get in some of your family photos in some cases. And you can clearly see the difference here because these guys, these almost, those are Germans and some of these guys are British and you can just see. But they're out there doing that because it's Christmas Day, and at the end of the day, they all got back in the trenches and started trying to kill each other again. But for that one day, there was peace. For that one day, there was the cessation of the violence. And, and it's not one day, you know, it wasn't Thanksgiving. Of course, that wouldn't have made a lot of sense if there weren't even Amer any Americans that are fighting. But it wasn't, it wasn't a British holiday, and it wasn't a German holiday, and it wasn't a... A French holiday was the one holiday that shared between all of the nations that were involved in that conflict, Christmas, because that's the day that the Prince of Peace came. And Isaiah says it this way, a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. So on Christmas, even though it's probably not the day Jesus was born on, it doesn't matter because you can celebrate a holiday, you can celebrate something important, even if it's not the very day that it happened. But on the day that Jesus, that, that we celebrate Christmas, we celebrate the coming of the Prince of Peace. In the passage, the expanded version of the passage that, that Ken read over in Luke chapter 2, and I love this version of the King James, so this is one of the few passages I choose to quote out of the King James. It says, there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be the sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace and goodwill towards men. The angels came, and it's ironic because they came to proclaim peace. And of course the first result was it terrified the people that saw them because angels can be scary looking. 
But the angel says, don't worry, I'm not here for something bad. I'm here to tell you that something wonderful has happened. And when the rest of his chorus shows up, they announce, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace and goodwill towards men. I don't know why I have this again, because it's just a duplicate. But, glory to God in the highest, and peace among men. And so, I want to break this down into two aspects of this, because the peace that Christ brings... There are two significant elements of this. The first one is the peace among men that the angels announced. There's, uh, actually, I give a lie on this. This is the New, New American Standard version of it, and it reads slightly differently. It reads, glory to God in the highest on earth, peace among men with whom he is pleased. And that's a slightly more accurate modern-day way of understanding the way that that actually was written in the King James Version. And so when we talk about peace among men, that's one of the effects that Christ brings. Christ brings peace among men. Now, if you just look at the world, you might think that, that somebody got that one wrong. You know, there was sort of some sort of a misunderstanding or a translation error because it certainly doesn't look like we've got peace among men. But Paul explains that it's a specific kind of peace among men. Over in Ephesians chapter 2, he says, Therefore, remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, by which he's actually talking to all of us, were at the time separated from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Remember that under the old law, the old law was for the Jews. It wasn't for everybody else. God didn't reveal himself specifically to anybody but the Jews, basically. And so they knew what God wanted, and they knew what God expected, and they had a relationship with him, but the rest of the world didn't. And that includes all of our ancestors as Gentiles. But Paul says, but now in Christ Jesus... You who were formerly far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace, and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross, by it having put to death the enmity. See, what he's saying is that there was a war, there was hostility between the people of God, the Israelites, the Jews, and the rest of the world, the people of the world, who lived in that world. And he says the thing that Christ did by coming and by, by, by preaching peace and by becoming the peace offering is that he made it possible for the people who were stuck out in the world and didn't have a relationship with God, he made it possible for them to have a relationship with God just like the Jews had had well, better than the one that Jesus had had. had. He made it possible for all of them to have a relationship by grace. And, and think about the difference between the mindset you have when you feel like you're having to follow rules versus the mindset you have when you feel like you're getting to do good things. You know, one, one of those, you are, you're probably bitter and unhappy and kind of angry about it. The other one, you are happy and, and joyful about having to do it. And that's the difference is not only do we go from a situation where two, there's two sides godly people, or the people of God and the people who aren't of God, but we also go to a situation where both sides now can have a relationship with God based on grace rather than on law. And so now everybody has access to God, and, he, and, and Paul finishes by saying, he came and preached peace to you who are far away, and peace to those who are near, for through him we both have our access to one spirit, to the Father, in one spirit, to the Father. So... Through the, the, the coming of Christ, through his sacrifice, peace is possible between those who were formerly the people of God and those who were formerly not the people of God. It's possible for all of them to have that access. And because of that, that hostility, that dividing wall that Paul talks about is gone now. And Jesus is the one that did that. But that's not all. In fact, that's not even the most important thing. The most important thing is what's revealed in the second half of that verse where the angel said, peace on earth, peace among men, with whom he, that is God, is pleased. Because the biggest problem we have isn't the hostility we have with one another. The biggest problem we have is the hostility that we have with God. Over in Romans chapter 5, Paul says, While we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare to die. So he says, when we couldn't help ourselves, when we were still ungodly, Christ died for us, even though... You're hard-pressed to find somebody who'd be willing to die for a godly man, for a good person. Christ came and died for a bunch of people who weren't even good. He says, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 
Much more than that, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. So he says, we were still sinners. We were not good people. We weren't people that God should love. We were people that should be hated by God. And, and he continues by saying, for if while we were enemies, enemies, we were sinners, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved in his life. And so what we have is this idea that the peace, or rather the hostility between man and God, is fixed in Christ, is repaired, because he reconciled us to God. That's the peace treaty, basically. Jesus is creating, is the peace treaty between us and God to make it possible for us to have a relationship with God that's not based out of enmity. And he kind of summarizes it by saying this, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we exult in the hope of the glory of God. We're not just kind of happy that things have turned out this way. He says we exult in this. We are thrilled at the way that this has turned out because it's bad to be at odds with men. That's what all the murder and the hostility and the discord is about. But it's a lot worse to be enemies with God because you can't win that battle. You can't, you can't win that war because God is all-powerful. And so to be God's enemy is to be in the worst possible place you can imagine. And so Jesus doesn't just give us peace among men. Jesus gives us peace with God. And because of that, we become instruments of his peace instruments of Christ's peace, the peace that Christ brought with him when he came into the world, we have now had that role passed on to us. And, and it, it, it's not, he's not subtle about this. He makes it very clear to his apostles in the upper room when, he's, uh, when they're partaking of the Lord's Supper, he makes it clear that the mission that he came for, to preach peace, to be peace, to, to, uh, to preach the kingdom, he's done. He's moving on, and it's going to be passed on to them. And they're troubled by this. They're, they're concerned about this. They're anxious. Maybe they're afraid because they don't know exactly what it's going to look like. And Jesus says, don't worry. We're going to take care of it. He says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth. That same spirit that Paul says is what brings us that unity, gets rid of the hostility between men and men and between men and God. He says, I'm going to send you the spirit of truth, the helper, the Holy Spirit, who the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give you. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. Jesus says, I'm going to go. I can't stay. And you're going to, be, you're going to feel like you're alone, but you're going to have the Holy Spirit and because I'm leaving you with the Holy Spirit, you can also know that you have peace. You can know that you're at peace with God. You can have peace with your fellow man, especially as you're preaching the gospel. And as Mark pointed out, you can have peace about what's to come, about what comes after this life. You don't have to worry about what's happened in this life because you know that at the end of this life, something better is coming. And the people that you lose in this life the ones that we've lost, we're going to get to see those people again because they're going to be in heaven just as we're going to be in heaven, just as we're going to be in the presence of God. And so there's peace in spite of the fact that the world is still chaotic, in spite of the fact that bad stuff is still happening, in spite of the fact that there is disease and discord and uh, you know hunger and, and, and suffering. Those things are always going to be there, but peace is still possible because God can give us peace when the Holy Spirit is in us. I said we're instruments of his peace. The first part of understanding being instruments of his peace is understanding where our peace comes from, but then it doesn't stop there because Jesus says, just because you've got peace isn't enough, you need to do something with it. You need to spread that. And so over in Matthew chapter 5, he says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Peacemakers shall be called sons of God. And it's interesting because a little bit further on in Matthew chapter 5, down in verses 43 through 45, it says, you have heard it said that it was, You've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. 
he's reiterating, he says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. And then he says, if you do things that spread peace, you're going to be sons of your Father who is in heaven. That's actually really logical. It makes a lot of sense. And he says the reason that that shows that you're sons of your Father is because even though God is at hostility, is in hostility with the world, even though the world hates God, he still does good things. He still blesses them. He still gives them the things that are necessary for life because God still loves them, even if he doesn't have the same kind of relationship with them that he does with his people. And so as Christians, we are called to spread God's peace. We are called to be at peace first, but then we are also called to bring peace around us. And part of that is a don't. Don't do things that are disruptive. Don't do things that cause more you know, more disunity that cause more discord. But the other aspect of it is a proactive one, an aspect of going out and doing things that will make people be more at peace. And, and, and in Philippians chapter 4, Paul articulates what may be the single most difficult commandment in the entire scripture, in all of the scripture, because he says, do everything without complaining or arguing. And if you just stop right there, that would make it the most difficult commandment in all the scriptures because we are not good at not complaining or arguing at all. But he says, do it so that you may become blameless and pure. There it is again, children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation. See, we show the world that we are children of God when we are at peace and everyone else is at war. When we are... When we are confident in our salvation and everyone else is freaking out. When we are the ones who are, who are responding in a peaceful way to someone who is violent or someone who is abusive, when people are fighting and, 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 and there's discord, when we're the ones who are saying, let's find ways to, to work together, let's find ways to compromise. And it doesn't mean we compromise our faith, it doesn't, it doesn't mean that we have to agree with everybody about everything, but there are different ways to approach things to make something be a peaceful resolution versus an angry resolution. And he says, if you do that, if you, if you are blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation, you will shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the word of life. For far too long in, in, in the history of the churches of Christ, as with most churches, our history of how we spread the gospel has been one of contention. One of saying, here's what's wrong with what you believe, here's what way we are right. That is the opposite of what Paul is saying here. Paul says here, you hold out the word of light and you shine like stars in the universe because you bring peace with you, not because you bring argument. Not because you're better at beating down the other guy's reasons for what he believes or denigrating the ideas that he follows. It's because you bring peace and you demonstrate that peace in how you live and in the fact that people see in you the confidence and comfort of knowing that you're in God and knowing that you have God's peace in you. And when you do that, you shine like stars and message becomes attractive, not because you're so good at arguing, but because God is so good at shining out. So the message I want us to take is, yeah, this has been a pretty lousy year. There have been a lot of bad things that have happened, and they're continuing to happen. But that's the world's way of looking at this year. That's the human understanding of this year. And, and that doesn't mean that as Christians we don't experience that because we are humans and we live in the world. But what it does mean is that as Christians we understand that there's something more going on here than just the bad things of this world. And that ultimately we have a peace, even in these times of trial, even in these, these ugly situations, we have a peace from God because we know that we're at peace with God, we're in harmony with Him. We know that we are the brothers and sisters of every man on, on earth man and woman on earth who's willing to listen to the call of God, and most of all, or, or, or most importantly in some ways of all, we know that there is a future that is not bound by these limitations, that is not broken and damaged and ugly and mean and, and, and inhumane, that is the perfect future that God wants for his people. And that's what we're looking forward to. And that's where our peace ultimately comes from. Let's stand and sing. Peace, perfect peace, in this dark world of sin, the blood of Jesus whispers peace within, peace, perfect peace, by thronging duties press to Peace, perfect peace, with 
Yeah.